yesterday, spring arrived. For some, it's just a date on the calendar, but for others, well, we can feel the length of the days and we are energized by the light. We are called out of our winters, out of our hiding, and even though we can't really gather, we can hope and we can dream. We can prepare for the new days ahead. Some of our friends from the United Church of Canada have some thoughts about what we need in the days ahead. What the world needs now is to be vaccinated. And some laughter would be a good thing too. Our world needs more patience to endure this long night of the soul pandemic. Our world needs healing, reconciliation, and hope. Our world needs more non-white people asking that question. Our world needs resolve and coordination so that people and planet can flourish. Our world needs systems to dismantle racism, not just by words, but by actions. Our world needs radical redistribution of resources so there is enough for all. Our world needs followers of Jesus working with him to make a difference. Our world needs mission and service. Please, make a gift through mission and service this Easter season. The world needs us to be church, together. Does the arrival of spring help you to dream? Can you feel the difference? Do you notice more light, more hope, more optimism? Spring reminds us that we are not stuck. We are moving forward. And it's time to sing a new song. Welcome to worship with Jubilee United Church. Thank you. 
Every time that we gather virtually or in person, we commit ourselves to being a safe place, a safe place for you, for your loved ones, for your children or your parents, for your hopes and for your hurts. It is our intent to be community with you, to love you as you are. We are not all the same and we not only acknowledge that, but we celebrate the fact that we don't all vote the same way or have the same ways of speaking about God or Jesus, but we are always learning how to love each other, even when we disagree, even when we've been wrong or wronged. The land upon which Jubilee Church sits was home, comfort, and faith to many First Nations peoples, including the Petun, Wendat, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga of the Credit. Toronto is part of a vast territory from Quebec through Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio, all around the Great Lakes, covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This agreement recognized that this land has enough space and resources to sustain many peoples, many nations. When settlers were invited into this agreement, they did not honor the simple premise to take only what you need, leave some for others, and keep it clean. Instead, they divided the land into distinct properties and moved people into restricted areas. We recognize that there is history, wisdom, and spirit that transcends borders below our feet. We acknowledge that European settlers came with an intent to colonize and not to cooperate. And to that end, Indigenous peoples have been under attack from that time to this day. We commit ourselves to reconciling with our Indigenous siblings and living on this land with respect for the wisdom and love for the people who have been here for thousands of years and are here now. We are an affirming community, which means that we are a safe and welcoming place to all those who express their identity in the LGBTQ2S plus communities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirited. Our community will always include those who are non-binary, identify with other pronouns like they, them, and help to broaden our understanding of gender, identity, and God. We are all created in God's image, meant and empowered to reveal, receive, and share love. We recognize and give thanks for our many differences and support each other as we live unique lives. Jubilee is intentionally anti-racist, which doesn't mean that we yet fully appreciate the many perspectives that are part of our community, but we acknowledge a colonial perspective that can often miss the realities of diverse black lives, Asian lives, and other lives that have been misrepresented, targeted, or ignored by those in positions of power. We intentionally stand with anybody who has been told to go back where you came from. We lament our role in allowing racism to go unchecked and we commit ourselves to equity, the true hope of equal opportunity, voice, and dignity for all people. We do this work imperfectly, but we do it because we want to celebrate God's love and action in the full diversity of humanity. We see God and God's love in you. And so here we are, together but not the same. Many paths have led to this place and this moment. However you come to be here, welcome. We are all God's children, together. For the time being, Jubilee remains closed for in-person worship. This is how we love and protect our neighbor even as we love and protect ourselves. We keep up on the changing rules and regulations and also on the emergence of COVID-19 variants of concern, and we will always tend towards safety. For the time being, we share in virtual worship, phone calls, notes, supportive actions, and prayers. As much as many of us long to be in the same space together, we continue to celebrate that we are God's children together. We hold the community and each other in love and in prayer. As you've come to expect, Haley Brown will be hosting a check-in for kids and parents today at 2 p.m. The Zoom link is on the Jubilee website. And did you see what Haley and Jordana did yesterday on Facebook? <laughs> it was pretty amazing and it is just a start. 
Exciting news! Bible Storytime with Haley has officially launched on the Jubilee Facebook page. This interactive series offers regular faith formation activities for the littlest members of our community directly to your Facebook feed, led by Haley. Be sure to check out the first episode, now available on the Jubilee Facebook page. Subscribe so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes, and share with the little ones in your networks. This is a very exciting new programming opportunity. Tomorrow, Monday, March 22nd, we will have a watch and discussion party for episode two of the second season of First Contact. You can watch it on your own time at tvo.org. Just search First Contact season two, episode two, or you can watch it with us on Zoom at 7.15. It's a little less smooth, but it's still watchable. At 8 p.m., we will discuss what we have watched and perhaps come a little closer to understanding the truths of Indigenous life in Canada and what it is that we need to reconcile. The link is on the Jubilee website. And as always, I want your pictures. Well, we want to see your wonderful faces, so please don't stop sending them to me at nclyatjubilee.ca. Now, for the past couple of weeks, you have been sending me pictures and videos for Palm Sunday, and they are great, so please don't stop. I will be happy to receive them right through this Wednesday. After that, I'll be putting them in the Sunday service, so you have till Wednesday. And I have promised a prize for the most Canadian palm demonstration. And now I feel we can reveal that the prize will be a dozen butter tarts. Hard to get more Canadian than that, and poutine really doesn't travel nearly as well. So, you still have three days to get your picture or video into me, and a chance to win a dozen butter tarts. And please feel free to post it on social media and use the hashtag Jubilee Palms. Now, if palms aren't your thing, I have another challenge for you. And you have 10 days. Easter. I would love pictures of Easter bonnets, colorful hats. Ideally, I'd like to see you wearing your Easter bonnet. Or Easter eggs. I would love pictures of Easter eggs, actual eggs that have been dyed, or pictures of eggs. And just so everybody has a chance, how about a picture of resurrection? You know, new life. It might be in the garden. It might be something you see on a walk. It might be in your family or in your home. Anything that signals new life to you can be Easter for us. So please send it on. As always, send your pictures to nclie at jubileeunited.ca. So, what's going on for Holy Week? Glad you asked. Monday through Friday, March 29th through April 2nd, I will be posting a short reading from Scripture with some questions. It'll be posted on the Jubilee website and on the Jubilee Facebook page. And then from 6 p.m. to 6.40 p.m. that day, there will be a Zoom discussion for all those who wish to share the thoughts they've had during the day about the reading and about the questions. The Zoom link will be on the Jubilee website. On Thursday, April 1st, Monday, Thursday, at 7 p.m., we are going to honor the Last Supper by sharing dinner together over Zoom. You will provide your own food, of course, and if you want to, you are invited to share a story of one of the most memorable meals you've ever had. It doesn't have to be religious or spiritual. It might be the time you had dinner with the Governor General. It doesn't matter. But we're going to come together and share our stories, and then we will recall the story of the Last Supper and we will share in the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the wine. And together, well, together we're gonna to prepare ourselves for the days ahead. On Friday, April 2nd, Good Friday, there will be a virtual Good Friday service available from 10.30 a.m. On Sunday, April 4th, Easter Sunday, there will be an informal Easter sunrise service available from 7 a.m and a full virtual Easter service presented at 10.30 a.m. Links to all the services will be obvious and clear on the Jubilee website and will, of course, remain available through the day and the days ahead. So please join us, share us, invite your family and friends to be with us for Easter. For those who are journaling, allow us to offer these prompts for the week. If you had to give a TED Talk tomorrow, what would it be about? Write about something that you take for granted.
So that's some of what we're up to, and there is more to come. And all of this is possible because you and people like you continue to invest in Jubilee United Church. You invest your time and your passion, your love and your money, and we don't take any of it for granted. Thanks to you, we are inspired and enabled to be a church in a new age, a church that meets people wherever they may be and invites them to engage with a God who is met and experienced in diversity and love. A God who is with us in the hardest of times and in the best of times. A God who is with us today and will be with us in all of the tomorrows ahead. Thank you so much for your donations, your legacy gifts, and your love. As I come to light the Christ candle, to celebrate the light of Christ, I do so in the shadow of violence and death, in the darkness of anti-Asian racism. Anti-Asian racism is not new in Canada, but it has seen a marked increase since the COVID-19 pandemic. Perhaps looking to make sense of a dangerous world, some have made the choice to blame China for the virus and to take out their fear and anger on all Asian people. This is not the way of Jesus. Never the way of Jesus. We are all together siblings, children of God. American Christian educator and writer Kathy Kang said these words. The excitement as a child to get not just eight crayons, but the pack of 24, or if you're really lucky to get like the big box with 64 crayons and the, the little sharpener in the back, uh, only because you recognize that there might not be one color of red but many shades. And so I think that that's, that's why we need the diversity. We need to be able to do the many shades, the beauty of it and the fullness of it. Um, so what diversity gives us is the fullness of God. And so if we only know people who are just like us, then we only know just a sliver, just a little teeny bit of who God is and what God is capable of doing and creating and blessing. Our neighbors, our communities, our church must strive to love all of God's children, protect and stand with those who are under attack, whose humanity is diminished and denied. We need to actively stop Asian hate. We are not God's children alone. We are God's children together. When we are aware of the microaggressions, the little things that people do or people ignore that other the Asian people in our community, when we speak up and stand up with those who are at the greatest risk when expecting justice, as we live with this glorious gift of diversity, when we are community together, supporting and love one another, the light of Christ shines through us all. The light of Christ. In this time of Lent, we come to you, God, to confess. Emerging from our hiding places, we speak the truth knowing that you hear us in love. We weep, we cry, often alone, that we are not the people that we could be. This is not the world that it could be. We know that we're not responsible for everything, but we also know that we have turned our backs, shut our eyes, and shuttered our hearts when we might have participated in love and justice with you. Forgive us.
for the people that we have neglected, the lives that we have ignored, the love that we have withheld. Forgive us. God, let us dare to see the world through your eyes, no longer through curtains. Instead, remove from us all that keeps us from transformation, from new life. We pray, embracing the mystery of the cross and the promise of Easter. We pray in humility and in hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, read by Jordana Wright. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went to tell Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me 
the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. And God, may I never lightly presume to preach your word. And may we never lightly presume to hear your word. For in your word is hope an abundant life. Amen. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It's a simple request made by a couple of Greeks who wish to speak to Jesus. And so then Philip tells Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip, they get together and they go to Jesus. And I guess, I don't know, Philip didn't want to talk to Jesus, or maybe he was afraid to. Or maybe there was a, an informal bureaucracy, right? So Andrew was like Jesus' chief of staff, and all requests had to be channeled through him. Or maybe they were just shy. I don't know, you talked to him. No, no, you talked to him. No, no, you talked to him. Go on, it's your turn to talk to him. Anyway, whatever it is, Philip and Andrew convey the message, and then Jesus launches into a monologue that has absolutely nothing to do with the matter at hand. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. He doesn't say yes or no to his disciples. He doesn't say that he's too busy, not now. Completely out of context, he says, now the Son of Man is to be glorified. And then he goes on to talk about a grain of wheat needing to die before it lives again in another way. He talks about losing one's life in order to gain it, uh, about being shaken in his innermost depths to the extent of asking his father to save him from the impending ordeal, namely his death. Maybe we caught Jesus at a bad time. Or, Or maybe we caught John, the author of the gospel, trying to, I don't know, complete a picture in a few words. You know, like one of those postcards of Toronto, right? It's got the CN Tower and the St. Lawrence Market and Honest Ed's, the Royal Alex, Blue Jays, Raptors, Leafs, the CNE, Queen West, Second City, a streetcar. Gotta have a streetcar. And of course, you can't see all of those things at once or at the same time. But if you really want to know Toronto, well, then you've got to get on a streetcar and you've got to see and experience all of those things. That's the essence of Toronto. That's how to see the real Toronto. Or so the postcard says. In that little passage, it's as if John is taken, I don't know, a little bit from Jesus' baptism, you know, that voice like thunder, and a little bit from the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours, Father. The raising of Lazarus, The voice is not for my benefit, but for yours, he told them. 
a little bit of talking to the disciples. I can rebuild this temple in three days. You know, it's kind of like a postcard of Jesus sent by John saying, wish you were here. If you want to see Jesus, then you need to see these things. So, so were they satisfied, the Greeks? I mean, did they get to see Jesus in the story? Do we get to see him in this postcard that John has given us? Because let's be honest, it's not always easy to see God, is it? I mean, God's not, not always obvious in our world. I mean, especially after a year of COVID. I mean, we want to see God, but we don't always get what we want. God, it seems, is often deeply hidden, hidden deep inside us, hidden often in our world. I mean, God is no show-off, but we would really like God to be a show-off every now and again, wouldn't we? And the God revealed to us in much of our scripture would seem to be a hidden God who dwells in deep darkness. I'm pretty sure it was the prophet Isaiah who said, truly, you are a God who hides himself. (laughs) You know, I I read the star, the globe, sometimes the National Post, the sun, and I see lots of how Doug Ford is bungling everything, or Trudeau has made a mess of everything forever, or, I don't know, politicians seem to be putting us in peril, or scientists are destroying the economy, and that's just the first couple of pages. You keep going and there's racism and violence, encampments, anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers. Anne's resigned from Jubilee. God does seem to be hiding. There is so much pain and misery and disappointment these days. I begin to wonder, where? Where is God? I have good days and bad days, and sometimes, you know, I can see God so easily. But then the other days, the Bible never pretends for a moment that God is easily known in a world like this, right? Abraham had his mood swings. Job looks for God without much luck. And I think we wonder too, as we navigate a pandemic, as we struggle with the health of a loved one, as we wonder about our own future, as we feel run down and run over by all this isolation, Why do such things happen? Is it fair? Is there any purpose or point behind them? Or are we alone in a cold, uncaring universe? Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Maybe God's fed up with us. Maybe God has just finally had enough. I mean, we break commandments. We are part and parcel of a society that could be a lot more, could do a lot more for the hungry, the sick, the elderly, the struggling, the hurting. The world is not always a friendly place, is it? And you know what? I know that I should be champing at the bit to get out of my house and change the world. But some days... Some days I don't want COVID to end because I just want to stay home and hide and say, oh, thank God it's not my job that's at risk. Thank heavens that's not my child. Is God angry at me? Angry at us for not being who we could be? For not living up to the covenant between us and God? Do you remember what we heard from Jeremiah today? Jordana read it. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There are those who believe that this is a prophecy about Jesus. The new covenant is is Jesus. 
And, and I, don't, I don't think so. And I guess it would take a, another sermon to explain it all, but, but simply put, if everything in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we often call the Old Testament, if everything in the Hebrew Scriptures points to Jesus, then everything that God promises the Jews, that very relationship, well, it's false. Right? It was all pointing to something later. And I, I don't buy that. I think God loved humanity back then. I think God loves humanity right now. So much so that this covenant is written on our hearts. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that powerful? Written on our hearts. Talk about personal. Imagine how intimate that is. God has written on our hearts. But surely then, we've broken that covenant too. And it's probably even worse because it's written on our hearts. I mean, oh, surely God has given up on us. If you believe that, I think that you may have missed something. It's written on our hearts, which means it can't be thrown away. It's not a piece of paper. It's not a contract. It's in here. You can't throw it away. It's a new covenant. Do you get it? The people broke the old one, so God made a new one. Do you get it? Even when we are unfaithful, even when we give up on God, God isn't unfaithful, and God does not give up on us. God is prepared to make new covenants. Even when we fail, God still honors the old covenant to the point of making a new one. And God stays with us. So God did not give up on us back then. God does not give up on us now. So where is God? Well, maybe the little speech Jesus gave wasn't entirely out of context. Remember, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The Greeks wanted to see Jesus. But did they really? We want to see Jesus. But do we really want to see Jesus? I mean, we want to see the baby in Bethlehem love the baby. And we want to see the gentle shepherd who doesn't love a gentle shepherd. But that's not all there is to Jesus, right? Not much of a postcard, a baby and a shepherd. This Jesus who presents himself to us, this Jesus who wants us to see, is a Jesus not found only in a stable, but also found in, in death. The death of a grain of wheat the death of a man on the cross. This Jesus is troubled and is found where people are troubled and hurting, where people are losing their lives and feeling dread in their hearts. The kind of dread that makes you say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You want to see Jesus? Good, good for you, but be ready because it's not always a pretty postcard. You see, some folks think that the best way to experience God is to watch a sunset, marvel at a young person playing the piano, enjoy kittens on YouTube. They seem to believe that seeing God means that there is no, no pain, no more difficulty, no more struggle, just, just smiles and delight. 
But Jesus, Jesus says otherwise. I mean, sure, the sun set the piano work wonderfully. And who doesn't love kittens on YouTube? But don't turn your back on hard times. Don't, don't shy away from struggling times because Jesus is there too. Sometimes, especially there. In the midst of the darkness, we catch glimpses like, like fireflies on a summer evening. Sometimes we can, we can see God or feel God's presence in the simplest little glimpses of grace. A phone rings and a voice says, I had you on my mind. I just thought I'd call and see how you're doing. Oh, I'm fine, you say. And you pause a moment. No. No, you know what? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fine at all. Look, I, I, I really need to talk to somebody. You, you couldn't have called it a better time. Grace happens. Groceries arrive at your doorstep. I mean, you know, you know who brought them, but, but you weren't expecting them. A neighbor makes your very favorite soup and makes it just for you, not because she had extra. You understand, sometimes when things are the darkest, suddenly it's as if, it's as if a light has broken through with a sense of peace that you can't quite put into words. Just, oh, there it is. Somehow you know that deep down, no matter what, you're not alone. You are loved. And yet other times, it doesn't seem to happen. I mean, let's be honest. I sat beside a dear friend and watched him die. And it didn't happen just the other day, but, but it happened and I remember it and there was no light. I have looked all around for grace in vain sometimes, waiting for something wonderful to happen, make it all make sense, make it all worthwhile, but it didn't come. No nurse came into the room with good news, no sudden remission, no miracle cure, no grace. Is my faith all in vain? It's then, it's then that I remember the new covenant with God. It's written on my heart. I want to see Jesus. I want to see God. And sometimes it's time for me to look inside. When the outside's not providing any answers, I need to look inside. In the hurt, in the struggle, God is there. Sometimes very quietly, sometimes comforting. Sometimes telling me to just let go. Sometimes telling me to get up and get help. Sometimes telling you to be strong, you know? Sometimes telling you it, it, it's okay to cry, right? The voice, the presence, the feeling says a bunch of different things at different times, but it's always there because it's written on our hearts. People may break promise. God doesn't. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. It's all really a matter of looking, isn't it? Are we really looking? Sometimes looking out, sometimes looking in. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy. But God is there. Sending postcards. <laughs> You know, in my paper, there are stories of people getting vaccines and neighbors helping neighbors. They're not on the front pages, but if you work your way to the back pages. You remember Mi'kmaq fishers now own half of Clearwater Seafood. That's cooperative progress. That's part of the postcard. You know, at Jubilee, we have virtual gatherings allowing folks to talk openly about subjects that we might never have managed to talk about in person from racism to theology and all sorts of things. We've made connections with folks that, that we would never have made if not for the shuttering of churches and the necessity of virtual connection. That's part of the postcard. That's, that's a glimpse of grace. That's a little bit of seeing Jesus. 
I was thinking about all the things that Anne and I have done together over the past few years, and although I'm sad of her leaving, just thinking about the things we've done inspired me. It made me look forward to the future. That's part of the postcard. In one of our Zoom meetings the other day, someone started laughing with such complete abandon that it changed my whole day for the better. That's a glimpse of grace. That's part of the postcard. That's when I'm seeing Jesus. I have talked with those who are not finding comfort or strength in their struggles, but have invited me to be in their struggle with them, to just listen to them. And that trust and that hope, well, that's grace to me. Being invited into that, that's part of the postcard. You know that in COVID times, we have baptized three children, three different families, and we've got two more families waiting to have children baptized. On Holy Week, an impromptu collection of folk are going to be delivering care packages to some of our most vulnerable. That's part of the postcard. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Open your eyes. Look, see Open your heart, feel, know, read the newspaper, but read the back pages of the newspaper as well. Don't just settle for the stories up front. And then you know what? Put your paper down and call someone. Zoom with some people, some new people that you haven't met before. Meet people. See Jesus. Feel God's presence. It really does work. It sometimes takes time, but as you work at it, until you get there, God will keep sending postcards saying, not wish you were here, but promising soon you will be here. I know that because I know that God never leaves us. God has promised, made a covenant. It's written on our hearts. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. But in this moment, we thank you especially for the covenant written on our hearts, the promise that we will always belong to you, even as you will always belong to us. God, let us live relying on that covenant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy God, you have called us by name and within your abundant and never-ending love, you have laid claim on our hearts, our souls, and our offerings. You are our God, and we are your people. We pray today for those who often find it difficult to feel and know because of how they are treated or what they've been told that your love manifests for everybody. We pray for those who are grieving, who are lonely, who are ill and who are caregiving, who are just holding on for one more day. We pray for those longing for the simple touch of a handshake we pray for those who have been locked down in spaces where hands are used for much, much worse. We pray for those whose lands have been stolen, whose water has been poisoned, and whose mothers and daughters, aunties and lovers continue to go missing, never to be seen again. We pray for frontline workers, sex workers, and those with precarious employment. 
We pray for those who are without housing, without food, and those who need to choose between one or the other. And especially on this day of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, we acknowledge God that there are some days, some moments, where grief rests collectively on all our hearts. We pray this morning for those who are targeted, hated, reviled, and scapegoated because of who they are, where they come from, because they demand a life outside of the status quo. God, you know what happens when earthly power is threatened. All too often it involves blood and tears, mixing together, dripping from a cross. We weep, we lament, we mourn, and yet we also find resolve. We commit to discerning our roles and then doing what work is ours to do to best bring about your kingdom here on earth. May it be so. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Go forth from this moment and know that you belong to God and God belongs to you, not to keep, but to share. So go forth and share yourself, share God and know that God, the creator, is with you in all you do. Nothing will ever change that. Know that Jesus Christ walks with us, knows what it is to walk down the paths that we walk every day and know that the Holy Spirit absolutely surrounds and fills each and every one of us. Until we gather again, remember, the covenant is written on our hearts. It can never, ever be broken. Amen. <laughs>